Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers, and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arua, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The virtual clinical pharmacy institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 386 of our pharmacotherapy series, which majors in pain and its management. This part is a continuation of the case of patient LOV discussed in part 385. LOV has now completed chemoradiation therapy, and the mucositis pain has resolved. He continues to have persistent burning neuropathic pain rated 8 of 10 in the neck and shoulders and is using transdermal fentanyl 100 micrograms per hour, along with 5 doses of immediate release oral morphine 30 milligrams per day. He is also taking gabapentin 900 mg orally 3 times a day and using a lidocaine 5% patch on each shoulder. LOV's oncologist wants to switch to oral methadone for neuropathic pain management. So my first question to you in this part reads, what oral methadone dose should LOV be started on? Let's discuss methadone dose calculation. Methadone is an opioid agonist with analgesic activity at mu and delta receptors. Additional mechanisms of action that make it unique from other opioids and a good option for neuropathic pain include serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibition and antagonist effects at the NMDA receptor. Rotation to methadone is recommended when a patient has an inadequate response to other opioids or experiences intolerable side effects such as delirium, myoclonus, or nausea. A trial with methadone is warranted for LOV, because his neuropathic pain is not well controlled with transdermal fentanyl and other co-analgesics, including gabapentin and lidocaine. Unlike short-acting opioids, methadone has a long half-life that ranges from 15 to 60 hours with a duration of action of 6 to 12 hours. The conversion to methadone is not proportional like other opioid equian algesic dose calculations. Older opioid dosing tables list a single conversion factor of 20 mg of oral methadone, or 10 mg IV methadone, equian algesic to 30 mg of oral morphine. The single methadone conversion factor was intended for acute pain and does not account for chronic use. The conversion ratios vary with the morphine dose. Contemporary tables contain three or more morphine to methadone ratios to adjust for the magnitude of the methadone dose potency with higher morphine daily dose requirements for chronic non-cancer and cancer pain. LOV's total daily dose of morphine is 390 mg after converting transdermal fentanyl and adding the immediate release morphine. The dose of oral morphine falls within the dose range of 301 to 600 mg, which corresponds to a 10 to 1 oral morphine to oral methadone ratio. 
LOV's total daily dose of methadone is approximately 39 mg. Guidelines recommend when switching to methadone from higher doses of another opioid, start methadone therapy no higher than 30 to 40 mg per day, with initial dose increases of no more than 10 mg per day every 5 to 7 days. For most patients, the recommended methadone dose interval is every 8 hours. Older adults or frail patients may need methadone dosed every 12 hours to reduce the occurrence of side effects such as sedation. LOV's total daily dose of methadone should be divided into three doses and administered on an 8-hour interval. However, methadone is available in tablets, that is 5 and 10 mg, or oral solution. The problem with LOV's total daily methadone dose is that it does not divide evenly using tablets. Splitting methadone tablets is not recommended because of the inconsistency in the dose with unequal tablet portions. Methadone solution is not convenient to use, and the dose needs to be drawn accurately with an oral syringe to prevent overdosing. LOV would need approximately 11 to 13 mg of oral methadone solution per dose, which may be difficult to calibrate with the oral syringe. Therefore, LOV's methadone dose should be rounded down to the nearest available tablet size, e.g., 10 mg. Using a rapid switch transition from transdermal fentanyl to methadone, LOV should be instructed to remove the transdermal fentanyl patch and begin methadone 10 mg orally every 8 hours approximately 12 hours after the patch has been removed. LOV can continue to use morphine sulfate immediate release 30 mg every 2 hours as needed for breakthrough pain. The immediate release morphine dose may need to be reduced if LOV has a good response to methadone. Because methadone has a long terminal half-life, it will take four or more days to achieve steady state. Unless LOV is experiencing severe pain, the methadone dose should not be increased before five days. LOV should be encouraged to use the immediate release morphine during the transition period. The methadone dose can be adjusted based on the total daily dose of morphine used for pain control during the transition period. My next question to you reads, what are the signs and symptoms of methadone toxicity that should be communicated to LOV? Let's discuss methadone toxicity signs and symptoms. LOV should be instructed to take methadone exactly as prescribed to prevent serious problems with breathing. He should be told about the signs and symptoms of methadone toxicity including shallow breathing, slowed respirations followed by periods of not breathing, slurred speech or difficulty talking, loud snoring, and inability to walk normally. LOV should be told to seek medical attention immediately if he experiences any of these signs and symptoms of methadone toxicity. He should also let family members living with him know about the risks of methadone so they can be aware of the signs and symptoms of methadone toxicity. Naloxone nasal spray and injection kits are now available for purchase at pharmacies to prevent fatal respiratory depression caused by opioids. LOV's family members should be counseled that this antidote would be beneficial to keep at home due to the risks associated with methadone. The next question reads. What are the recommendations for monitoring cardiac toxicity associated with methadone use in LOV?
Let's discuss methadone toxicity monitoring. Methadone can cause prolongation of the QTC interval and increase the risk for development of torsid de pua, a potentially fatal arrhythmia. Factors associated with QTC prolongation are methadone doses greater than 100 mg per day, hyperkalemia, low prothrombin level, suggestive of reduced liver function, and drug interactions involving the cytochrome P453A4 enzyme. Consensus guidelines have been published on cardiac monitoring for patients taking methadone. The guidelines recommend pretreatment screening, electrocardiogram evaluation, and risk stratification for QTC intervals exceeding 500 milliseconds. For a QTC interval exceeding 500 milliseconds, the consensus guidelines recommend reducing or discontinuing methadone LOV should have an ECG ordered prior to initiation of methadone to check his baseline cardiac function. Periodic ECG monitoring should be done if the dose is increased or LOV experiences new symptoms such as dizziness or fainting which may signal a change in cardiac function. The next question reads, how should opioid-related side effects be managed in LOV? Let's talk about opioid side effect management. Appropriate use of opioids requires minimizing the occurrence of side effects including sedation, nausea, vomiting, pruritus, myoclonus, and cognitive impairment. Provides information on the treatment of common opioid-related side effects. In cancer patients, Multiple factors may contribute to the emergence of opioid side effects such as renal insufficiency, nausea, and vomiting caused by changes in gut motility or chemotherapy, sedation owing to metabolic disturbances, and concomitant use of other sedatives or antiemetics. Tolerance to most of the opioid side effects develops in three to seven days. If the side effects do not diminish with time, Treatment may include switching to a different opioid or adding another medication to counteract the undesired effect. Respiratory depression is a serious adverse event and often is preceded by sedation. With methadone, the peak respiratory depressant effects typically occur later and persist longer than with other opioids. Naloxone is an opioid receptor antagonist that can be used to reverse respiratory depression caused by opioid medications. Opioid-tolerant patients are exquisitely sensitive to opioid antagonists. If naloxone is necessary, it should be titrated to effect to prevent profound withdrawal, seizures, arrhythmias, and severe pain, e.g., the analgesic effect of opioids is reversed with naloxone. Patients who are overdosed on methadone will require a continuous IV infusion of naloxone for 24 to 36 hours because of the long elimination half-life of methadone. The next question reads. What are other options for LOV if his pain is not controlled with conventional pharmacotherapy? Let's briefly discuss refractory cancer pain management. Neuraxial opioid administration, that is epidural or intrathecal, 
can be used to treat cancer pain that is refractory to conventional therapy with opioids and co-analgesic medications. Long-term neuraxial therapy must be administered through an implantable intrathecal pump to avoid infection complications. Indications for use of neuraxial therapy include neuropathic pain and mixed neuropathic nociceptive pain. Medication selection is based on the patient's allergy history and response to a screening trial. Opioids, e.g., morphine, hydromorphone, or fentanyl, local anesthetics, e.g., bupivacaine, or ropivacaine, clonidine, ziconotide, and baclofen are commonly used in neuraxial regimens. Complementary and alternative medicine therapies are widely used by patients in the management of cancer pain, dyspnea, and nausea and vomiting. Auricular acupuncture, therapeutic touch, and hypnosis may help with the management of cancer pain. Music therapy, massage, meditation, and hypnosis may help to reduce anxiety caused by dyspnea. Acupuncture and guided imagery may be beneficial in treating chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Oral cannabinoid formulations, dronabinol and nabilon, are approved by the FDA for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting refractory to conventional antiemetic therapy. Several studies of the endogenous cannabinoid receptors, that is CB1 and CB2, have demonstrated efficacy in the management of pain. In the CNS, the CB1 receptor is expressed in the areas involved in nociceptive processing, including the periaqueductal gray matter and dorsal horn of the spinal cord. The CB2 receptor is expressed on cells of the immune system and is involved in modulation of inflammation and pain. CB2 receptor activation has been shown to be analgesic in neuropathic pain models. Medical use of cannabinoids has been debated in many states in the USA. In October 2009, the Department of Justice issued a memorandum to U.S. attorneys stating that federal resources should not be used to prosecute persons whose actions comply with their state's laws permitting medical use of cannabis. Currently, 23 states and Washington, D.C. allow the use of medical cannabis for various diseases and including cancer pain. So there you have it. Our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Natharua, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video which will be part 387.